Good morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ. We're glad that you're here and pray that the Lord blesses you. Uh, we're going to have Brother Bill lead us in, in a word of prayer before we get started. Let me put some of this on the screen so you can follow along with us. And today's going to be rather an interesting class because we're going to be going... Wait, how come I don't see that? Okay. Actually, what's going on here? Okay, I guess that's all right. Yeah, uh-huh. Yes. Okay, this doesn't look yeah. like normal, but I guess it's okay. Hopefully it'll all work. Let me see, I'm gonna need this there. And this here. And then start this. All right, Brother Bill, we'll need some prayer. Please bow with me. Father God, we thank you so much for waking us this morning, letting us rise to see your new mercies today. We thank you for keeping us safe as we come here. We thank you for Mike and his diligent studies and his willingness to, to share his thoughts on what he has reaped from your word. Father, we pray that you be with all those who need your special care and attention. We pray that you be with our law enforcement during this time of tribulation and unrest in our country. Father, we just ask that you would intervene and help us to once again become the United States of America. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for all you do for us. We thank you for all you give us. We thank you especially for Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Brother Bill. Amen. <coughs> All right, well, we're looking at the book of Galatians, and hopefully you have your material. We're going to be using some of that. I'll try to put it on the screen so you can see it for those of you that are at home and watching. Let me just review for you some of the things that we've covered, and, and these are the general charts that you have. We talked about the chronological order of the New Testament. We talked about the general outline of the New Testament. These, Like I said, these are the charts that you have. We talked about the progressive edition of Paul's epistles or letters, and then we pointed out the main subject for Paul's letter. And so let me ask you again, since, la since last week, we seem to be a little confused about it. Uh, what is the book of Galatians about? Salvation. salvation. All right, very good. Now, that doesn't mean that in, that in this idea of salvation that, that he doesn't deal with false teachers. He does. But the subject is about salvation. It's about how you're saved. And therefore, he deals with those false teachers who have problems by teaching a different thing. So uh, we also looked at the, Paul's early life and his conversion. Uh, where was he brought up? Tarsus. Tarsus. Who was he brought up under? Gamaliel. Okay. And uh, in what tradition was he brought up? Jewish. Judaism, right? Somebody tell me the difference between Judaism and the Old Testament. What's the difference between the Old Testament and Judaism? Okay, so Judaism was the Jewish traditions and commentaries regarding the Old Testament. So they used the Old Testament, but then they put in all their traditions, their rules, their understandings, and those became the standard for the people in the, in the time of Jesus. And it was a system that was basically based on legalism. And so that's what's under consideration as we talk about it. Then we talked about the apparent charges of Paul and there were three of them. What were those three charges? Anybody remember? What were the three charges that they would make against Paul? He wasn't a genuine apostle? What else? Okay, he didn't receive his gifts like the other, but he had to learn his message. And what was the third one? He was a pleaser of men, very good. And so uh, Paul refers to all of those in here. Then we looked at Paul's journey to, to indicate when it was that I thought, and along with some other people, when the book of Galatians was written. And I'm not going to go through that again, but basically, when do I believe that the book of Galatians was written? Was it in his 
first journey? Was it after his first journey? Was it before his first journey? When was it? Anybody remember? Okay. After his first journey, but before uh, Acts 15. Uh, because Acts 15 dealt with that problem of circumcision, remember? And some people believe that that's when the book of Galatians was actually, that's when the events in the book of Galatians happened, but I believe they happened before that. And who remembers why I think that's important? <clears throat> Anybody? See, this isn't telling you how good students you are. This is telling me how well of a teacher I am. So you remember why I told you that it was important for us to, to know that? All I heard was mumble, mumble. <laughs> the reason is because if it was done during the Acts 15 conference or council, then it might seem like Paul had to be taught it. But if it's something done before the council, then Paul already understood it. Paul received it by revelation. And the Jerusalem council just simply affirmed what Paul was saying. And that's the reason why we spend time talking about that. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to get into the book of Galatians. And just as an overall real quick overview, you have chart 58. It's the last chart I think you have in your chart section. And in your chart section, it has the, the, the you know, overall um, kind of a review of it. And by the way, this isn't my chart. So, but most of the stuff in here, you know, is pretty, pretty major ideas. So there, so it's not anything that I need to correct. Um, no, it's the one that says Galatians, chart 58, it says on it. Yes, it, it, it should be one of the, one of the last charts. It should be after your map that you have there. Uh, that's in there. Yes. Can you, can you say that again? What you just explained about why uh, Acts 15. Sure. It, it, if Paul, it, if the discussion in Galatians happened after Acts 15, then it looks like Paul had to be corrected or Paul had to be taught by the apostles that Jeru that circumcision wasn't necessary. But if it, if he it would. But if it was written before Acts 15, then it proves that Paul was already teaching that by inspiration and didn't need the apostles to teach him anything. Does that help? Right. Right. Yeah, you should teach it because you sound more simple than I do. You, you know, if, if I don't make it complicated, people wonder why I'm here. So. Yeah. Okay, so as you take a look at that chart, chart number 58, and remember these aren't my chart, but, but they're charts that I've found that are interesting. It, it gives you a kind of a big overview of the book. You notice that there's vindication, exposition, and application. And basically the, the first two chapters deal with, with uh, Paul vindicating himself or talking about who he is. Uh, and then you have the exposition where he talks about the, the, the way people are saved. And what's interesting is that's only it's only two chapters. So understanding how you're saved doesn't require a five month course uh, in Bible study in order for you to know how you're saved. And I'm afraid sometimes we think that it is because our idea of salvation is everybody has to believe the way I do. So I got to make sure they all know the same thing I do in order for them to be saved. And that's kind of what the uh, that's what Judaism taught. Yeah, you had to be had to be trained in Judaism in order for you to be uh, um, one of God's people. And then you have the application in chapters five and six. And of course, it only has six, six chapters to it. Uh, and then you notice, you know, underneath the vindication, uh, it has the gospel is not according to man. Uh, and then under the exposition, you have the gospel is superior to law. And then on the application that the gospel uh, of spirit is, uh, we, we live by, by the Spirit and we walk by faith. In other words, we're free in Jesus. And so then you have some of the key words that are there. So that takes care of, of that. So let me close this out so people can see this. So the next thing that I want to do, for those of you that have your material, is I want to look at the questions that you have, that you're supposed to have before we get into Galatians chapter 1. 
Uh, and so we're going to be looking at those. And if you, I don't know exactly what page number that is in your material five. there. Page five in your material. Uh, I have one here because we're going to be going over those, at least the questions over the text. And uh, we're going to be going over those and answering those. I know they weren't in order. They yeah, they, they, they're, not, they're not in order, but it looks like. It looks like this, looks like that. It says Galatians 1, preview material, Paul's salutation in early life. Everybody everybody got it? Everybody there? All right, so uh, number one, and these are questions that you should be able to just get from the text. I don't ask you know theological questions to begin with. I just wanna make sure that your nose has been in the book. Uh, as we begin to as we begin to read it and look at it, and so number one says, "Who wrote the book?" Paul did. All right. And uh, uh, to whom was the book written? All right. So the Galatian churches. It was an area that had churches. Number three, uh, who was with the writer? Okay. Was it what? Brethren. Remember, these are ta these are taken just from the text. That you get it, it's from the text. It's not from you know all the education you've gotten. It's just what's in the book. That's the that's the point of this. Okay, number four. Um, how did the writer greet his listeners? All right, peace and grace be unto you. Right. Okay. And what was it that the writer says Jesus did for us? Okay, he, he died for our sins, right? And, and delivered us from the present evil age. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, uh, number, number six, what was the, uh, at what was the writer amazed? Okay, they were amazed at how, he was amazed at how quickly they turned from the grace of God. And he said, and then number seven is how many gospels are there? <laughs> How many, how many gospels are there? Apparently there's one, even though you might have put down two, because he says that what's a gospel is really not a gospel, what some people call a gospel. All right. So number eight, what was it that the writers uh, what, what was it that the writer repeated in this chapter? All right, so if somebody uh, writes another gospel or gives you another gospel, let him be accursed, All right? Okay, uh, number nine, what can't one do if he wants to please Christ? All right, can't be a pleaser of men. Uh, number 10, from where did Paul get his revelation? All right, uh, from Jesus. He got it by revelation from God or from Jesus. Number 11, Yes, that's what, remember when Ananias came to him in Acts 9? It says, I came that you might receive the Holy Spirit and preach the word. All right, uh, number 11, explain how Paul acted before he became a Christian. All right, killing Christians, persecuting them, chasing them from city to city, right? 12, <clears throat> uh, what did God call Paul to do? All right. And then 13, what did Paul not do immediately after he was converted? Okay, he didn't rest. All right, he didn't go and confer with the other apostles. All right, and then, oops, 14, uh, where was the first place Paul went after he was converted? He went into Arabia, didn't he? Number 15, where did Paul go next and for how long? Well, actually, actually, he preached in Damascus, then he went into Arabia for three years. All right, 16. Where did Paul go after this? Then he went to Jerusalem. All right. Then 17. Did the churches of Judea know how Paul looked at this time? No. No. 18. What did the churches of Judea keep on hearing? 
all right, that the one who was persecuting them is now preaching the faith, right? Okay. And then uh, 19, I think that was 19 we covered, right? Yeah. And then 19 was, what did the churches do when they heard this? All right, they glorified God. All right, so those are the questions that you had that we wanted to cover over the book of Galatians, at least to make sure that your, that your mind is in the text. And so what we want to do today is we want to get into the text of Galatians and take a look. And after you know all that stuff, that, that the previous material that I gave you, that I hope you remember all of it, uh, because it'll be beneficial as we get as we get in here. So number Galatians 1, verse 1, we'll read down to verse 5. It says, Paul and apostle not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, uh, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. And so as Paul begins his message, uh, he says, Paul, an apostle. Now, that's generally the way Paul starts. He generally starts off his material that way. He says, Paul, an apostle. Now, uh, tell me something about an apostle. What is an apostle? All right. So was he sent by the church? Was he sent by uh, uh, another person? Was he sent by a preacher? All right. So notice here that he says an apostle not sent from men nor through the agency of men. Now, why would it be important for Paul to start his letter like that? He didn't start it like that in other places, not so much. Why, is it, why, why would he start it like that? Uh, okay, because they weren't recognizing him. They weren't recognizing him as an apostle from Jesus. They might have said, well, he's an apostle of the church, like Barnabas is called an apostle of the church when the church uh, sent Paul and Barnabas off on their missionary journey. Paul was called an apostle because he was an apostle of the church. But Paul points out that he's not an apostle of men, nor through the agency of men. So it wasn't men who made Paul an apostle. Um, there is certainly nothing wrong if you if you want to say that you're on a mission. You know, the church sent you to to Home Depot to buy something for them. That you're an apostle of the church. There's certainly nothing wrong with saying that because you've been sent by the church, but that's not the way the terminology is used here. Paul is saying he was, he was specifically sent, picked by Jesus. And when did that happen? On the road to Damascus. When he was going on the road to Damascus, that's when God picked him. Matter of fact, God told Ananias, I have chosen him. He's a chosen instrument. He's a vessel of mine for a task that I'm calling him to do. Uh, we haven't been called to those tasks. Uh, I'm, 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 you guys know I'm you know, a preacher, if you want to say that, but God didn't call me to be a preacher. God didn't tell me I had to be a preacher, okay? I could have been a plumber. I could have been an architect. I could have been a contender. Uh, I, I could have been whatever I wanted to be that wasn't sinful. Uh, I chose to preach because I wanted to, not because Jesus says, Mike, you have to preach. Paul had to preach. Paul was picked and told that he had to preach. And in 1 Corinthians, he tells us that he had to preach because God called him to preach. So Paul is an apostle, just like the other apostles, with the exception that Paul became an apostle out of due time. Out of due time meant not when the other apostles were called. And again, I just want to emphasize for you, for people who might be listening, that there are churches today that claim that they get apostles all the time. They get a new apostle when one of their apostles dies, in which case, apparently, the time to be an apostle is now. That's the normal time. And therefore, Paul would not have said he was born out of due time. Paul was born, born at a time when apostles weren't being born anymore. And so there are no more apostles of Jesus the way the Bible teaches apostles of Jesus. There might be apostles of the church, and so that's I want you to understand that. And that's why Paul is making this his point as he begins with, with the very heart of what he's going to be discussing. He says, not sent from men or through the agency of men, but through Jesus Christ. 
So his apostleship is from who? Jesus. Jesus sent him. He saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. It, Jesus talked to him. Jesus never has talked to me the way uh, Jesus talked to Paul. He never has appeared to me. Uh, I, you know, I, I would love it as a preacher to be able to tell you, Jesus appeared to me and told me to preach. You know, that, that, would, that would probably give me more weight with some people. But God doesn't want your faith to rest on the weight I have. God wants your faith to rest on God and what he says. Uh, and so therefore all apostles, therefore all, I'm sorry, therefore all preachers are in the same boat. And that is, we know nothing without the word of God. Yes. What do you mean? Amen. Um, go ahead. What? I just, I understand, understand. Even though that you wasn't picked by God, you still have the same faith that you have for God. Okay. Okay. But still the knowledge that you have comes from God. That's true. And, and, and that knowledge comes from God, but I can use that knowledge in different ways. But yes, you're absolutely right. All of our knowledge comes from God. So he says, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead? So the, <coughs> so the same God that raised Jesus from the dead. And uh, how hard is it to raise somebody from the dead? It's impossible. So why would Paul say that he's an apostle from the same God who raised Jesus from the dead? Why would he mention that? Okay, it is the same God. Is it? You think that's the only reason he's mentioning it? Just because he is the same God? He was sure that he did got all of his knowledge, wisdom, everything that he grew up in. All right, so the same God that can raise Jesus from the dead can give Paul all the information he needs without him having to study or 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 think about it or read books or read commentaries. The same God that raised Jesus from the dead can, if God wants, call Paul to be an apostle. And so that's that Paul is connecting the power of God with his commission is what he's doing. Uh, and so he says, whom, whom raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me. Now, when Paul's writing this letter, remember, this is after everything in Galatians happens. Paul isn't writing this as it's happening. He writes this afterwards. And when he says, and all the brethren who are with me, we could sit around and say, well, who are those brethren? Well, if it's the church at Antioch, then we know it includes Barnabas and probably John Mark and, and probably some other people that we're familiar with there. But his point isn't that they're individuals. His point is other people agree with me. There's other people who know exactly what I'm teaching, who accept what I'm teaching, and they're behind me as I write this letter to you. If I'm the only guy that believes something and you, you scour the world looking for somebody else who believes what I believe, you're probably going to have trouble doing what? Believing me. Yeah, you're going to have trouble buying what I'm telling you. But if you find other people that believe what I believe, you, you, you might say, well, apparently other people are convinced too, so maybe we should listen, right? Now, that, that doesn't mean just because other people are, are believe it that you should listen, but Paul is pointing out that with his apostleship, there's also other people that are teaching the very same thing, and that's what he means when he says, and all the brethren who are with me. So there's more than just a couple. There's a lot of brethren, the, bre the brethren where he's at, the church where he's at, and if we're pretty confident that wrote this from, from the city of, of Antioch, what kind of church was the church at Antioch? It was a large church, okay? It was a Gentile church. That's the kind of church it was. It was a Gentile church. And Barnabas was there, the, the son of encouragement. Uh, the church had become pretty famous. Matter of fact, it had become so famous, it was the first place that they were called Christians. It was the first place they were called Christians there uh, as, as Paul was there. So it's all of those brethren that are there. It's the Gentile group of people that are there. They're the, they're the ones that are writing this letter with Paul and are being commended by him. And so in verse 2, he says, And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Now remember, he's writing to the area of Galatia. And we looked at that at Paul's first missionary journey as chart. You know, that would be Iconium, Derby, Lystra, around that area. Uh, Galatia, would, Galatia would be like a, a province or an area. Okay. Uh, kind of like when we talk about the San Joaquin Valley, uh, 
name me some cities that are in the San Joaquin Valley. Stockton, Modesto, Fresno, okay? So Tulare, uh, those are some of, the, so some of the cities that are in the, the uh, San Joaquin area. And Galatia is an area like that. It's not necessarily a specifically designated boundary, it's an area. And in that area, Paul is writing this letter to them because that's where Paul went on his first missionary journey and converted a number of people that were there. And so he's writing, he says, to, to all the brethren with me and to the churches of Galatia. So he's pointing out that there's various groups of Christians in those areas, right? And then that's what he's writing to. Um, I think it's interesting that Paul doesn't say, and I'm writing to a central church that's going to tell you what you're supposed to believe. Each individual church is responsible to hear the message of God, and each, each individual church is responsible for what they believe, just as each individual Christian is responsible for what they believe. And God designed it like that because God wants us to be free, and there's no way you can be free if somebody is over you. If, if God says, well, you're free, but you got to listen to this guy over here. Even the apostles didn't tell us that we had to listen to them. They said, you have to listen to the word of God. And we, we're teaching you the word of God, but that's what you have to listen to. You don't listen to us. We had, the apostles said, we have to listen to the word of God as well as you do. Uh, come on in, uh, as well as you do. And, and so they, they were individuals who were, who were doing that. And so that's the, the, the church. By the way, what does the word church mean? Called out, comes from the word ecclesia, is the word church. All right, so as we're looking at Galatians chapter, um, uh, chapter one, uh, he says, the churches of Galatia, and he says, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you notice the, the other books where Paul writes, many of those books were written in exactly the same kind of language. Uh, in uh, Colossians 1 and verse 3, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 1, 2, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this was his usual way of discussing this with people or of, of introducing himself to people. Now, why does he say grace to you and peace from God? Okay, because some are Jewish and the Jews, when they greeted one another, they would say, no, the, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the Jews would say shalom. What does shalom mean? Peace. They would greet peace. The, the Gentiles would go, good day. And so when Paul writes grace and peace, grace is hope you have a good day. Hope God's gracious to you. So they would, they would say grace and peace. So Paul, in his usual manner, is addressing both Jews and Gentiles, and he's addressing them in their, in their customary greeting. But also, I want us to understand that Paul really does believe that God's people need grace and peace, and grace and peace only are, only are found in one place. Where's that? In Jesus, in the, fa in the Father, and through God. Remember Sunday sermon? It's, it's real simple. You either stay with God or you die. Remember? You're either on God's side or you die. That's because God's the only one who gives life. God's the only one who gives grace. God's the only one who gives goodness. And so Paul is pointing out that grace and peace are from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the other things I want you to notice is that, is that as he says that, though this is usual, usual customary greeting, I also want you to be impressed with the fact that he is emphasizing that grace and peace come from Jesus and the Father. They don't come from the law. It doesn't come by doing everything right. Okay, There has never been and never will be, as far as I know, a single person that did everything right and got to go to heaven because they did everything right. Now, there are certainly babies that went to heaven that were sinless, they were innocent, 
but they never did reach what you and I call the age of accountability. They didn't reach that point where they could choose between right and wrong. And so it's not that they didn't do, uh, you know, that they kept all the commandments. It's that they never did anything wrong because they didn't have the opportunity. That's right. They, they were pure. They were innocent. Okay. But uh, uh, so I, I want to emphasize to you that what Paul is saying is grace and peace come from Jesus. It doesn't come from the church. It doesn't come from a preacher. It doesn't come from some system. Grace and peace come through Jesus Christ and, and God. And so if Jesus Christ picked Paul to preach the message, and Paul's preaching a message of grace, which, by the way, if you remember when we went through the material uh, about Paul's journeys, everywhere he went, he preached what? Grace. He preached grace. And he also preached the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God and the grace of God are, are, are the same thing. Because without the kingdom of God, you can't have the grace of God. Because the kingdom is the, the government or the rule that, that, that makes it possible for the king, whoever the king is, to be gracious to the people. And you and I are the people, and Jesus is gracious to us. And so even at the very beginning of this book, Paul is pointing out that it's through Jesus Christ that we receive all grace and truth. And we, we really need to understand that. It's not the sign that's outside our church building uh, that, that gives us grace and truth. Now, why through Jesus do we have grace and truth? Verse, verse 4, or grace and peace, sorry. Verse 4 says, who gave himself for our sins. So what did, what did Jesus do for us? He gave himself for our sins, right? Did we redeem ourselves by doing the law? Is, is that the way we received grace, grace and peace? No, we received it because somebody paid the price for our crimes. We all had sinned. Whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, everybody has sinned. We're, we're, we're all under sin, every single one of us. Uh, in Romans chapter, chapter 3, and I'm just going to use my Bible here instead of the thing up here, even though I like to use that so people can see it. In, in Romans chapter 3, And uh, down here at verse, um, I'm going to look at verse 20, uh, 19. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. So what does the law do? Makes us accountable to God. Makes us accountable to God because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So the law gives the knowledge of sin. It doesn't take away sin. It doesn't remove sin. Jesus came and gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us. Now, when he says our sins, does that mean that the blood of Jesus only applies to uh, faithful people? No, he paid the price for everybody. Everybody can have their sins forgiven if, if they'll come and come to Jesus, because only in Jesus do we have life. Outside of Jesus, we don't have life. Okay, we don't have life outside of Jesus. So verse 4 says, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. Now tell me who needs to be rescued. People who are in peril. People who are in danger need to be rescued. You don't have to rescue people who are already okay. You rescue people who are in trouble. And so he came to rescue us. And as he comes to rescue us, he says, from this present evil age. Okay, he's going to come to rescue us from this present evil age. Okay, and so Jesus comes to rescue us. And certainly that would include uh, sin. But I would suggest to you that it includes more than sin that's under consideration. But uh, do you remember when Jesus was talking to the, to the Jews, when they asked for a sign? What did Jesus say to them? What did he say before that? He says, a sinful and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. 
Now, here's what I want you to understand. Remember that here's our timeline. And Jesus uh, comes into the world. He dies. He's buried. He uh, lives with the apostles for 40 days, goes up to heaven, sits at the right hand of God, becomes king, sends down the Holy Spirit to tell us that the kingdom of God started. And then over here in 70 AD, what happens in 70 AD? Jerusalem is destroyed. So Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD. Jesus told them when he was here that this was an evil and wicked generation. He said it's an evil and wicked generation. And he said, and no sign will be given you except the sign of Jonah. What's the idea of the sign of Jonah? There you go. So just like Jonah was in the heart of the earth, in the belly of the, of the whale or the fish, and then the, the whale spit him up and Jonah walked into Nineveh. Jesus is going to be in the heart of the earth for three days and then he's going to be raised. But he says, I'm giving that to this wicked generation. So it could be that when Paul is saying here that Jesus came to deliver us from this perverse generation, he's not just talking about wicked men in general. He might be, and certainly that could be included, but the emphasis seems to be more that he wants to deliver them from this wicked generation, from this idea of Judaism and legalism that is being preached to these people because that's an evil and wicked generation. Uh, one of the things that, that I learned as I was you know, going over this, and I hadn't noticed it before, was that there's something missing in this, in this introductory material that Paul always lists in his introductions and all the other ones. And I know you guys are smarter than me, so you probably figured it out. Anybody have, any, have an idea of what it is? Okay, there's something that Paul always says in his greetings that's not in this one. No, grace and peace are in there. What? Oh, to the saints? Well, no, he mentioned to the church, so that kind of be the same group. Well, yeah, but not, no, I'm not talking about, you know, little things. Like I'm talking about like a, a, a thought, a, you know. I'll, I'll help because I didn't, I didn't figure it out myself either, okay? Are you, are you ready? Here, here's, here's what you don't have in here. I thank God for you. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and he says, I thank God for you. Paul writes to Colossian church, I thank God for you. Paul writes, you know, the, the church in Rome, I thank God for you. The Corinthian church had all kinds of problems. They had all kinds of personal problems, all kinds of, of congregational problems, and Paul writes to them and says, I thank you. But there is no, I thank God for you guys here. It's not in here. The point is that whatever these guys were doing was so bad, Paul said, I, I can't thank God for what you're doing. And the reason is, is because this, what they're doing here, is going to lead to people's destruction. That's why. See, the church in Corinth, they, got, they have a few people in there that are, that are messing up. And, you know, it's really bad messing up, but that, they can still get to heaven. When I, I'm talking about the church, but if the church here holds to what they're teaching, then this church is going to be lost. And so there is no thank you for you guys. So Paul, Paul doesn't have that usual greeting that he has everywhere else. Now, the last part of verse four says, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, verse five says, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. And that to whom be glory forever and ever, ever amen is given to God. Now, if you remember, when Jesus was talking to the Jews during this time that he was alive, <clears throat> he said to them that the Jews seek honor from somewhere. They seek honor from one another. They seek the glory from one another. Okay? They seek the glory from one another. Now, how would they be seeking glory from one another? You're such a good man. Oh, you keep the law so good. Oh, you, you go to the Church of Christ. You're so good. I'm glad you go to the Church of Christ. That's really great. And who are we seeking glory from? Men. Now, 
you understand that I love the Church of Christ. There's only one church. It's God's church. But our problem is we've defined it in such a way that we honor other people who are doing what we're doing, and we dishonor other people who might think a little different than we are because they can't be in the church. Because that's the way we're viewing the church. And so the glory is not to me, and it's not to you. Paul isn't going to be, isn't going to receive glory because he's doing things right. He's giving glory to God. So we're supposed to seek the glory of God. We don't care what other churches of Christ do. Don't misunderstand me. We love everybody, right? And when I say we don't care, it doesn't mean that, you know, we want them to not get to heaven. We want everybody to get to heaven. But the idea is, is we're not going to be overly concerned about what some other church of Christ is doing. And so I better make sure and line up with what they're doing, because if I don't line up with what they're doing, then I'm not going to be able to get to heaven. Matter of fact, that's the reason we've had so much division in our camp. And yes. Well, salvation is not in the church. Salvation, uh, the church is saved by Jesus. Salvation is in Jesus. That, that, well, sure. We, and, and we definitely need to surround ourselves with good Christians. Absolutely. We're, we're, not, we're not talking about it. I'm just trying to get us to understand the idea of who gets the glory and who gets the, the, the honor. It's Jesus that gets the honor. It's God that gets the glory and not us. Yes. Right. Right. Sure. That's right. So apparently this problem in the book of Galatians was was of such magnitude that Paul didn't you didn't make his usual, uh, you know, greetings of thanks for them, because he wanted to get right into his discussion. And he does, and everything that, that he does has been set up for him to get into his discussion. So anything before? Right. Right, yep. So any, anything before we get into six? Verse six. All right, <laughs> verse six says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace, who called you by the grace of Christ, or by the grace of God. He says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who want to disturb you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, uh, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men? Or, or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. And so as Paul is writing in here in, in Galatians 1 and verse 6, he says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by his grace. Notice that he doesn't say that you're deserting some doctrine or you're de deserting some law. It says you're, you're deserting him. You're deserting him who called you by grace to turn. See, you can follow Jesus and, and be legalistic, and God says you have turned from following him. Rather than depending on him, who are you depending on? Yourself. You're depending on yourself to get it all right. You're depending on yourself to figure it out right. You're depending on yourself to to take care of all your sins and, and to figure it all. And when you got it all figured out, then that's when you're going to get to heaven because you got it all figured out. And so you're depending on yourself instead of depending on them. So therefore, you've become like this wicked generation of Judaism who has all these traditions that they say you got to keep all these traditions 
And if you don't keep these traditions, then you really aren't one of God's people. And so Paul isn't teaching people to keep these traditions. So therefore, they're not God's people. And he, he points out, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him. Now, why would he say quickly? <laughs> Must have been fast. Well, if you remember, Paul's missionary journey was in, in chapter 13. It ended in chapter 14. And, and so there was chapter 14, then chapter 15. I figured that out myself. 15 comes after 14. 15 is when they're having the discussion about circumcision, right? But this book was written before that. So it must have been a couple of couple of months after Paul preached in, in Galatia and those regions. And then all of a sudden he's hearing, he's hearing news that they are now becoming legalistic in their approach to religion. Now, I also want to suggest this. That sometimes we start off looking at the grace and for some reason it turns into legalism and I think it happens unintentionally we start looking at the grace of God and we appreciate the grace of God and so we, we want you know to find the grace of God and before you know it we're starting to point out things that people have to do in order to get to heaven because we are doing them now don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't do any of those kind of things that, you, that we used to do before that's what's going to get you to heaven you're not doing it, you can't get to heaven well, certainly those are things you shouldn't do, but is that what's going to get us to heaven? No. no. But what happens is we then become legalistic in our approach to things. And so I think we need to be very careful. So Paul says, I'm amazed that you're quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ. So what, what Jesus does for us is grace. He extends grace to us. <clears throat> there isn't anybody who's getting to heaven without the grace of God. Uh, look, if you will, with me to Romans chapter, I believe it's chapter five. And down here at verse, um, verse 17, Romans 5, 17. Romans 5, 17. <clears throat> He's comparing Jesus with Adam. He says, for if by the transgression of the one, that's Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so then, as though so then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. So just like we uh, we did what what uh, Adam did, it results in death when we do what Jesus wants us to do, it results in life through his one act of obedience. Uh, in verse uh, 19, it says, or verse uh, 19, it says, for as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded more. What does that mean? So, so the so the more I sinned, the more. No, that's what it says. It says, it says the, 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 more, the more I sin, the more grace God gives me. Now, the, the consequence of that is some people say, well, should we go on sinning? Paul says, no. But that doesn't change the fact that when we sin, what does God do for us? He forgives us, right? Which is, which is worse, stealing uh, some food to eat or stealing somebody's wife? Well, they're both sin. I'd much rather have you steal some bread from me than steal my wife. Yeah, but but how how much grace did did uh, did uh, uh, David need? Well, let's see. He killed a man, slept with his wife, lied about it, got a guy drunk. Wow, he needs a lot of grace because the law points out he had a lot of sin. 
So he says, so that, verse 21, so that as sin reigned in death. So sin reigns in death. In other words, we live in a world where you sin, you die. But what about all the good I do? You sin, you die. One sin, you die. But what about all the good? You die. He says, even so, grace would reign through righteousness, through eternal life. So in Jesus, I sin, and he forgives me. I sin, he gives me grace. I sin, what's, what's reigning in righteousness? Grace is reigning in righteousness. What reigns in, in uh, sin? Death. Death rules. That's the rule. In Jesus, you sin. The rule is you don't die. The rule is you live. And that's the grace that he's talking about in Galatians when he says, you have, I'm amazed that you have, have left so quickly the grace of Christ. He says, for a different gospel. Now, I know our time is up, but we, went, we started a little late today, so I'm going to take a little liberty. So he says, use this word gospel. What's the word gospel mean? Good news. The word gospel means good news. So he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. So he says there is a different I don't know if you can read this. Can you read that? No. Well, somebody say something. I need a dark mark. I need a dark mark. I can't read that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's even worse. Where's the good black one in the air one? Let's see if this works. Okay. There you go. So this is a different gospel. It's a different God. He says it's a different gospel. What does the word gospel mean? Good news. Well, wait a minute. How can it be a different good news if it's not good news? It's good news that Jesus Christ gives grace to those who earn it. <laughs> there you go. And that's the way we look at it sometimes, right? It's good good news. I, I've, I've done so much, God's going to give me grace because I've just done so much. You see, we don't, we don't have to say, I've done everything perfectly. We can just say, I've done enough, and so God's going to give me grace. Well, you're still depending on you. It's just still depending on he, That's, that's true. But these guys were also believing in the resurrection, but they weren't believing in the gospel. Okay? Because Jesus, uh, Paul doesn't, co doesn't condemn them for not believing the resurrection. So they were believing the resurrection. The problem is it started, it started by grace, and they turned it into legalism. They turned it into legalism. They turned it into, look at all the good things I'm doing, and you should do all these good things I'm doing, and since you're not, you can't get there. But he says, he says it's a different gospel, and then he says, which is really not another. Well, wait a minute. Is it a different gospel, or is it not? Because he says another. Well, this word another here is the word... That comes from this word. Homo. What is a, and, and we're all familiar with this, that's why I'm using it. What is a homosexual? Somebody who likes having another one just like them. That's what that word, this word another is this word another of the same kind. So when Paul says it's a gospel, he says it's not really a it's not really a gospel. It's a gospel of a different kind. 
He says that that, that good news is not really good news. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and so he says, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So they so somehow it's gone from grace to legalism. It's gone from what Christ meant to how men interpreted it. And that's what we need to be careful about. That's right. In, instead of trusting that God can save whoever he wants, however he wants, and we're just trying to help people come to Jesus. In God's church, and there's only one, are all the saved everywhere, no matter what kind of building they might be in, no matter where they might be, if they are putting their trust in God. And certainly they're putting their trust in God you would expect some changes in their life, but we need to make sure that we don't make the changes in their life the, the thing that determines their salvation instead of who they're trusting, which causes the change in their life. And that's, that's what we need to remember. So uh, he says in verse seven, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And so that's probably the reason why he wasn't too thankful for these people, because they're distorting the gospel of Christ. They're not just having a discussion about, well, you know, can, can, can Christians get a divorce or not get a divorce? Can Christians, uh, uh, you know, sue people or not sue people? Can, you know, uh, what do you think about the rapture stuff? Uh, yeah, that, that's, not, that's not what the problem is here. The problem here is they're changing the way people are being saved. And that's the problem. That's, that's, that's why he says it's a different gospel, which is really not another of the same kind. It's entirely different. Okay, it's entirely different. Remember when, remember when Jesus uh, was talking to the Pharisees, and he says the baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Where was it from? The gospel of Jesus. Is it from heaven or does it get interpreted through us like it did with the Judaizing teachers who began teaching their traditions as the things that were important and the things that marked one's faithfulness or whether it was, are you depending on Jesus to save you? And trying your best to do what he wants you to do. That's it. That's the reason Paul has such a tone with these people. It's not just they're making some mistakes on some doctrinal issues. They're changing the very way people see themselves as being saved. And in some groups, it's gone to the extent where only the clergy, the priests the bishops, the, the deacons, the, the popes, they're the ones who can bestow upon you forgiveness. They're the ones who can bestow upon you pardon. They can bestow upon you penance. They're the ones who can bestow upon you these things, and they're the, they're the ones who can marry you in the sight of God, but nobody else can marry you in the sight of God because they're the only ones that are authorized to do that for you. They're the big wigs. And therefore, that makes us subject to the big wigs. Yeah. <laughs> and there's only one person we're to be subject to, God. And then since we're subject to God, we then submit to whoever he wants us to submit to the way he wants us to submit. Yeah. Yep. All right, any questions or thoughts? All right, if nothing else, Spencer, would you come lead us in a prayer and we'll be dismissed? <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear God, we just pray that we continue to expedite 
time and also the circumstance of our walk in life that we are <clears throat> on the light of the world in Jesus Christ, that we might continue being in uh, fellowship one with another, praying for one another, comfort one another. We know it's a hard time and a time uh, we reach into a time that time will be no more and we continue to be in Jesus Christ. Be with us with our study, be with our brother. Might they might continue to uh, help us to understand the word more clearly by and by until we meet uh, Jesus in the air. If we uh, uh, haven't died, those that have died, we're going to meet, meet them in the air. We comfort one another with these words. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 And let me get offline here and then we can.